Welcome everybody to the RV Podcast, episode 404. And this week we're going to talk about when bad weather hits, what should RVers do? Hi everybody, I'm Mike Wetland. This is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. And we welcome you to this episode of the RV Podcast. If it's your first time here, welcome. If it's your second, third, fourth, or four hundred and fourth time, we hope you have subscribed and you can do it through your favorite app or uh, however you like, but uh, stay in touch with us. We have these new podcasts come out every single Wednesday morning. And uh, it seems like every every uh, week in the podcast we're talking about bad weather hitting and terrible storms i think just last week we had in our newsletter a young boy was killed in a campground when a limb fell on him um, so we thought this is a good time for us just to take a break this is summertime and ask that question particularly with a lot of new rvers out there is what do you do when when bad weather is about to hit and you are in an rv and we'll share lots of feedback on that lots of suggestions and that'll be coming up uh, in the next uh, section of the podcast. But we are back from um, a week's travel. We were uh, spent much of the week in Kentucky with some family, a little vacation, and we did some scouting for uh, one of our future travel books that we'll be writing down there. We're uh, at our Sticks and Bricks home in Michigan now, and we're about ready to leave here <laughs> and head to... Elkhart, Indiana. The RV capital of the world. We're all next week, we'll be hosting a big gathering there at the RV Motorhome Hall of Fame. And uh, we got all sorts of things planned. After you did the story about the driving school, the interest has skyrocketed. Everybody <laughs> wants, we're going to offer a driving school to those who have registered for this event. And uh, a lot of people want to do that. Lots they should. Of, they, it, it was, it's very I mean, if, if you're kind of making, trying to decide what you want to drive, you know, going to this driving school is perfect. And, and no matter what kind of an RV you have, a motorhome or a trailer or a fifth wheel, uh, a truck camper, whatever it is, driving it is a lot different than driving the vehicle that you're used to. Mm -hmm. And um, so the driving school is going to help a lot of people. Um, last week in episode 403, we talked about signs that we were noticing that seemed to indicate that the RV boom uh, has come to an end. And um, since then, we have heard lots more information uh, and some compelling new statistics that bolster that contention. And uh, what's come out since we did that podcast last week is RV retail sales uh, for the month of May. They're always a couple months behind. But in May, they were down 31.5%. That is a th almost a third over the, the rates that they were growing in uh, 2021. So they were really down in And May. you wouldn't expect them to be down like that in May because that's really the beginning of the camping season in most parts of the country. Now, wholesale orders sort of always drop seasonally and there's always a little bit of drop, but nothing like a 31.5% in May. Now, I'll be very anxious to see what the statistics in June have to say. We won't see those till next month, but uh, since then, we've also heard from a lot of our contacts in Elkhart, Indiana, and despite a very um, optimistic face that the RV industry uh, as a whole is placing on, oh, everything's great, it's not so great. There have been um, hundreds, if not thousands, of layoffs. Uh, many of the big companies have gone uh, to like four-day productions or three-day productions. There's always a... a a kind of a plant shutdown every summer uh, on the 4th of July. Most of the big auto makers shut down for a week or so. Uh, this week it's been two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, there are um, the, the parking lots, at the uh, employee parking lots are much emptier. There's not a lot of uh, optimism in terms of this boom that we've seen for the last two and a half years. It is over, and uh, our sources tell us that you know the layoffs are the proof of that. So, um, validating, I guess, what we talked about last week. Now, what does that mean to you as an RV consumer? It means you're probably going to be able to get a better deal and uh, on your RV, and uh, prices may start to become a little bit more competitive again, and that's good news. 
And you also have some good news. Yes, I have some good news about the price of gas. It, I take it you've noticed that when you filled your car up lately at the pump, it's a little less painful. The prices have gone down. The uh, national gas prices are falling all across the country. And some are even predicting the average national price per gallon could drop below $4 a gallon in the next couple of weeks. The national price for a gallon of gasoline was $4.696 as of Saturday, according to AAA. The highest recorded national average was $5.016, recorded June 14th. Some parts of the country are still paying as much as $6.11 per gallon. California. <laughs> oh, yeah. But in other parts, the prices have fallen to $4.20 per gallon. And the main reason prices are dropping, according to experts, is fear of a looming recession. Hmm. Recessions decrease demand for oil and gas, which uh, lowers the price. Many believe prices will continue to drop over the next few weeks, but others say don't count on it. Yeah, we noticed when we were in Kentucky, we paid, I think it was four twenty-eight a gallon. Mm -hmm. and it was a little bit more in uh, in Ohio. This was just coming back this weekend in our travels. Um, well, we'll see, but that could be good news, although the recession is not. No. <laughs> That's for sure. No, no, no. Uh, hey, I cannot resist sharing this story. It was reported by our friends at RV Business. Uh, there's a YouTube influencer out there, and they have a ch great channel. If you're interested in trucks at all, it's called the Fast Lane Truck Channel. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. But they recently did a range test, a mileage test, towing identical toy hauler travel trailers. They pitted one of those brand new Ford F-150 Lightnings, those uh, EVs, against a brand new GMC Denali Ultimate Edition with the 6.2 liter V8 gas engine. So long story short, the electric truck had a very serious problem with range, especially when it was towing. Uh, the onboard computer was unable to accurately calculate its range, even when they factored in the weight of the trailer and its height and width and all that stuff, the driver was forced to stop at 85 miles uh, earlier than was initially estimated. And when he found the place to charge it, it was a hassle because the nearest charging station that they had to go to, because they were right on near empty, was a Target store. And it didn't have a pull-through that would accommodate the vehicle towing a trailer, which would mean he'd have to somehow back it up and unhook the trailer. It was just a mess. Not good in terms of the EV and that uh, sharp new Ford uh, F-150 Lightning. Uh, we ran into a guy, I ran into a guy in Bardstown, Kentucky. He worked, in his shirt said he was with Carvana. And he was charging kind of like a, an EV electric uh, minivan. I don't remember what brand, what model it was. And I said, how long does it take you? And he said, well, I'm on the fast charge. It takes about 35 minutes. I said, well, how far can you go on that? He says, 37 miles. I said, that can't be right. 35 minutes to charge it? You go 37 miles? And he said, yeah. And he, I said, well, then you sure don't do many... Uh, cross-country trips. He says, oh, you can go cross-country. He says, there's a charging station about every 40 miles. And he just told me it only <laughs> goes 37 miles. So. And then I wonder what happens when you get in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and there's another story out today that said 5% of all the vehicles being sold in America now are electric vehicles. Yeah. So it's coming, and, and, it's, I, yeah. and all that's good. But don't get too excited about it in terms of the RV as we are right now. Okay, time to share some feedback that we've had this past week from our audience, uh, talking about various topics and things we've discussed, and you want to start with one? Yeah, this first one is uh, from uh, Dory. She said, my husband and I enjoyed your podcast, and I want to share my absolute best RV appliance, the West Bend Slow Cooker. It is deep enough for a roast, cooks, quickly, co uh, cooks quicker than my regular crock pot, and it has a griddle base for pancakes, grilled cheese, etc. The slow cooker is removable and safe for use in the oven or on the stovetop. Plus, it's freezer and dishwasher safe. 
It also comes with an insulated travel tote and cover. I can't cook without it, especially since our RV is a small travel trailer without an oven. Many thanks for all the wonderful information you give us. Well, thank you for that information. The West Bend, Bend Slow, Slow Cooker. cooker. Uh, we've done that. You've done that with a crock pot. The problem we have, always had with it is the way a lot of RVers do it, particularly those with motorhomes, is you plug it in in the galley and you put the crock pot in the sink, the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. And you might want to put a towel or something around it so it's not falling off and it's, it's you know, as you Secure. drive it. And then you cook your slow meal as you're driving down the road. But those the cords are very short on those crock pots because oh, they, they take up a lot of energy. Safety, I think it's to spend not spend the money on a cord that's adequate. No, I think it's safety. You know, they don't over over draw the kind of like the string around your neck. I see. That yeah. isn't there anymore. You mean on the on the yeah that hoodies. used to have on hoodies and stuff. Uh, I don't know. I think it's more it's uh, electrical heating and all that stuff because they take a lot of power and they're on for a long time. But. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you can find one that you can work like that's a great way to cook your meal as you're going down the road. Yes. Uh, all right, feedback. I got this that I wanted to share. And uh, this is from our friend James. And he said, uh, uh, we don't understand the use of showers in public restrooms. Remember, we had a uh, question a couple of weeks ago by somebody who was uh, using a public uh, a restroom and it was kind of a unisex thing they didn't like it they didn't know what they didn't to want do. a unisex yeah. shower but he's he's reacting he said we don't understand the use of showers in public restrooms by RVers no matter how well they're maintained we spent a fair amount purchasing our RV and one of the first decision points in the purchase process for us was the usability of a restroom and a shower in our RV uh, it's effectively our hotel on wheels, where we have total control over the cleanliness and privacy. That's what so many of us like in an RV. So I guess our question is, is why would anyone with a bathroom shower on their RV ever want to use a public shower? Because I can tell them, when we had a Class B, it ended up being a storage closet. We had so much put in there because there wasn't room for it anyplace <laughs> else. So to take a shower, you had a lot of things you had to take out. Then you had to wipe it down and dry it. And that took quite a while. I mean, it sounds easy to dry something, but it isn't that dry. And I always put a plastic bag on the shower heads because I've had experiences where it drips they drip, yeah. on the things in there. So there are times when I didn't want to use our shower. I didn't want to take all the stuff out and put it back and dry it out. It was just so nice. And sometimes, because we had bees and it was a very class small space. Class B, our bees. Yeah. I just wanted elbow room. I wanted space. And I wanted to dry my hair in the restroom so that I could have elbow room and I didn't heat up our, uh, our vehicle, our RV. So I am guilty of... Uh, <laughs> I said, don't you get that shower wet <laughs> yeah i would hear that i say well can't we just shower in the rv and no get in. i have to clean it up and i gotta move everything i said i'll help you and she looks at me and, no i'll do it um now that we have a, a class c it's a little easier because it's bigger mm -hmm. and now that we also have our uh, arcadia fifth wheel with a really nice bathroom yeah, that uh, bathroom is not a problem whatsoever we'll be using that I down in Elkhart, love that actually. bathroom i don't have anything stored in there i have room to store things other places but if you haven't lived in the smaller rvs yep. you don't understand that once in a while you want to spread out and you don't want to all right james that's uh, the answer it. from the boss the uh, ceo or whatever we want to call you of uh, rv lifestyle that's why <laughs> she doesn't like to use the uh sometimes use the uh, shower in our RV. All right, when we want to come back, we want to talk to you about weather, bad weather in particular, and what do you do as an RVer when bad weather is threatening. So stay with us. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds, competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that might be right for you. On July 30th, there's a big lakefront sales event at the Landings in Tennessee. Jennifer and I visited the landings just west of Nashville. They offer incredible RV lakefront properties, up to 70 times the size of a typical RV lot, with frontage on the biggest lake in Tennessee. 
We loved it. The scenery is breathtaking, and you own it outright. It's not a timeshare. It's your property, your way. You can have your own private dock. You can landscape, garden. They're pet-friendly. It's gated and secure with high-speed internet available. There's even free RV and boat storage. It's a wonderful place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations. Ready whenever you want. Dockable lakefronts start at only $59,900. There's financing and big discounts on multi-lot packages. For information, visit rvlakefrontland.com. That's rvlakefrontland.com. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, And there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World. And as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount. If you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10, when you buy $99 or more in merchandise, you'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. Welcome back, everybody. Now it's time for our topic of the week. And this one, I think, as we said at the top, is a very... Uh, important one and a timely one because this is the time when you see a lot of really bad weather uh, uh, in terms of thunderstorms and those constant tornadoes we hear about and we're about ready to start hearing about tropical storms and uh, we get as soon as August hits here the uh, start of the real heated up hurricane season so what do you do uh, as an RVer uh, when you're when you're out camping and and heavy storms are coming uh, specifically, uh, where do you go when you're in your RV? To uh, your knees. Yeah, at your <laughs> knees. That's uh, that's a big, big thing to do every day. We should do that, right? Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. All right. So a new member to the RV Lifestyle Facebook group named Linda, she recently posted a question for the group. Storms. Brand new here. Currently riding out our first storm. Kids slept through it but I'm wide awake, terrified. We're going to blow away or tip over. Anything I should be doing or just wait it out. So far, I don't like this camping business. Mm -hmm. The wind is wild and I feel like I'm on a cruise ship in rough waters. I wouldn't like that, cruise ship in rough waters. Well, Linda's question uh, brought a a huge response. Over a hundred comments came in in just the first couple hours after she posted it. Um, and we want to share some of those comments, but before we do, we also want to stress about a couple of things for you, a couple of big things. Uh, first of all, uh, bad storms and the wind that usually accompanies them are particularly dangerous to those in an RV. Uh, bad weather warnings are to be taken very seriously. We had a tornado that went through Gaylord, Michigan earlier this uh, uh, late spring. And I think it was back in early June. And uh, it went through an RV lot, actually. And the, the, I remember seeing those images from the drone shots, just these this mass of debris, this jumbled up RVs that were tossed and turned out there. Um, and you see that often in coverage. So bad weather warnings, when you hear them, are to be taken very seriously when you're in your RV. And that means that you need to be weather aware. Now, there are lots of different weather apps. Uh, On the RV Lifestyle Travel Blog, we have written uh, probably a half dozen stories over the years about weather apps and how to stay informed. And we will link to uh, the, the most recent one we did on weather apps that you should consider getting for your uh, smartphone. Um, and that'll be at rvlifestyle.com. And just look, look at that and you can click on the link there. But when camping, you need to check the forecast for your area a couple of times a day. It can change really quick. And I think about being in a floodplain. 
that's something you don't think about that it's raining upstream be aware yeah particularly out west uh but but many other places you know um i mean there were some horrible floods in waverly tennessee last year and uh it, it just suddenly overwhelmed these little creeks and the whole time I mean, a, a number of people perished in that but uh, we want to also talk about one good travel weather app that we have been using for about a year or so now and we really uh, recommend it highly. I have no connection with this company at all. I just like to point out something that we think is useful that you might too. The app is called Drive Weather and what it lets you do is uh, set your route uh, and set a couple of different routes and you can compare those routes creating stops, you can change your departure time, what time you want to arrive. And what it does is it will show you the weather at each stop along the way or at various waypoints. It's all about helping you make good decisions in regards to the weather. It's kind of like a pilot before mm -hmm. a pilot takes off in an airplane. Uh, he checks the expected yeah, weather. This way, this way, or this way, and maybe this is the best way. Yep, and, and that's what this app does. It kind of briefs you on the safest route, safest time. And again, we'll put a link to um, that, uh, that uh, Drive Weather app on the show notes for this episode at rvlifestyle.com. Now, there's one other thing that we recommend to you, and that's an emergency weather radio. And there's lots of different ones available out there. Some are solar-powered. And uh, some have a hand crank to charge the batteries. They're relatively inexpensive. And the main function of an emergency radio is to stay informed. You want to be sure that uh, yours comes with the ability to pick up an AM, FM radio station. As well as those uh, NOAA uh, weather bands out there. Yeah, you got to be aware of that too. Yes, we're going to post some recommendations on our favorites on the blog. So right now, we want to share uh, with you some, um, some group advice from those who are members of our RV Lifestyle Facebook group. Th this is from those members who were responding to Linda's question, what do you do when you're in an RV and bad weather is coming? Uh, one reader named Bob said, there are a few private campgrounds that are starting to build in storm shelters. Uh, the problem there is that they can't, don't allow uh, pets. Ah. Many people don't want to leave their pets, and I understand that, but uh, I understand the rule. Can you imagine uh, 50 people and Fluffy the cat and Brutus the pit bull <laughs> in the same room, both scared half to death and no escape routes? Fluffy is going to tear <laughs> Brutus to pieces. We have three big dogs. The trick for us is to hunker down in the family restroom or a big stall, self-contained. I am not leaving my fur babies, who are already scared of storms. When RVing full-time, it becomes your home. Well, underscoring the seriousness of bad weather, uh, a member of our Facebook group named Jennifer L. wrote, Put your awnings away. We survived a Class 3 tornado. Not that I ever want to do that again, but I'm a crazy person now with the weather apps and local news. And then if there's any kind of rain or winds, I'm on top of it. If a storm is going to take you out, it won't matter what you're in. I've seen what can happen to even the strongest building. That's, so pay that's, attention. That is for sure. And here's Ken who says, make sure your phone is set to get notifications for storms. And if it gets too bad or tornado warnings, get out of the camper and seek shelter. Most campgrounds, bathhouses, double as storm shelters. And we'd echo that and say that they are always safer than an mm -hmm. RV. Uh, a reader named uh, Tanya says, we're from Missouri and we now live in Alabama. So Tornado Alley is where we are in both states. We never go to a campground where we don't first know if there are shelters there and where we can go. Always download the nearest news weather app for upcoming weather. Usually that's like the local TV stations. We have stayed an extra day somewhere just to avoid bad weather. All you can do is have a plan as best as you can so you aren't in a bad situation. We've done that too. When mm -hmm. we've had bad weather in the forecast, we have 
uh, packed up early and left the campground. You just go, especially hail. You don't want your rig beat up by hail. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, uh, several readers shared rather harrowing stories like this one from Chuck. I have been through several storms and campers we have owned. The pop-up was the worst. Yes. The wind picked up the the slide out of uh, out of bed and dumped us out on the ground. We were under trees, and the guy camping behind us had a limb break off the tree and fall across his fifth wheel and nearly cut the camper in two. Mm. Big limb. His camper was new. I thought if that limb would have fallen on our camper, we we wouldn't have made it. After that, I had two campers totaled by hail. Mm. We have always survived. Hit a frontline wind while uh, driving, pulling the 30-foot trailer. It took me across the oncoming traffic lane and off that uh, side of the road next to a line of trees. We were very lucky. I managed to keep it upright. We have always had a guardian angel riding with us so far. So I guess if Chuck H. invites us camping, we're saying, eh, I'm busy this weekend, Chuck. <laughs> I think what he's saying is invite your guardian angel to come with you. Yeah. Uh, a member of our Facebook group named Angie has three suggestions. She says, one, straight line winds, 50 miles per hour or greater, have the ability to flip you over with more risk of you getting hit broadside as you're driving down the road. You may need to leave the trailer in these conditions. In other words, you're driving down the road and, and it's 50 mile another winds. Just pull over, get off the, the freeway or the road that you're on and wait until you maybe have to spend the night someplace, you know? Two, she says, if you do get flipped onto your side, everything on the opposite of the camper becomes a projectile that can hit, hurt, or crush you. For example, a loaded refrigerator. And most photos of rolled trailers show a separation of walls and ceiling resulting in a big pile of rubble that you'd be in. Falling trees, or third point, falling trees and tree limbs are a huge danger. A tree is going to win in a camper versus a tree incident every time. A four inch limb, about that big around, can penetrate the side or roof of your camper. We have a busted door right now due to this. A four inch tree that falls can crush the camper area to a good degree, such as bringing the roof down on top of a bunk. A larger tree can cause life ending damage as it will penetrate all areas hit and keep going until it hits something that stops it. Um, this is scary stuff. And this is why when bad weather, you just don't you know, tough it out inside the RV. If it's forecast for bad, you know, usually the storms go through, it's not long lasting, get out of the RV. Um, so that's, that's, those are good tips, kind of grim, but they're good tips. And Michael says, brace your tires and put your stabilizer leveling jacks down. Yeah, get a chunk and put chuck around both sides mm -hmm. of your tire. Uh, Bob says, if it's very windy, pull in your slides, less surface area for the wind to catch. Uh, and, and be, so many slides are broken with the wind hitting them and it just pulls the track mm -hmm. off. So that's really good advice when you got a bad storm, pull in your slides. It says, line up if you can with the wind, if possible, instead of broadside to it. Um, that's why you need that weather app and the radar and the, and, the, and the radio to find out which direction the wind's coming through. And here's a good tip. He says, hook up to your tow vehicle and face the wind. Mm -hmm. You have additional weight of your truck or your tow vehicle to add stability. And uh, Nancy adds another precaution. If you have water tanks, fill it. Heavy water doesn't move as easily. Yeah, what's water? 8.3 pounds, something like that, uh, or eight, uh, per, uh, per, gallon. Uh, per gallon of water. So You need to make yourself up. heavy. Yeah. Anchor down. Well, that's just a sampling of the responses that we got to this question from our RV Lifestyle Facebook group. And uh, we will link to that whole stream with, and there'll be probably many more responses after the, that we've, uh, that we've not carried that you, you might want to look at too. So we'll put a link uh, on our Facebook group. And uh, our RV Facebook group has become a very valuable resource when you have RV concerns or questions, or even if you're looking for recommendations as to where to camp and what to see. No fee. Membership is free. Just go to rvlifestyle.com slash Facebook to join. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. Yeah. 
I think we have a hundred, almost 115,000 members now in that group. So, and a hats off. I always like to hats off to all of our moderators who keep out all the nastiness. And uh, thanks to our members who are great in reporting it. We really are proud of the um, upbeat and helpful community that the RV Lifestyle Facebook group has. All right, when we come back, we're going to answer your questions to us. Stay with us. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And Battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And it'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back, everybody. And now it's time for your questions. You ask us questions and we do our best to answer them. And the best way for you to send us those questions or your comments or your feedback to anything we've been talking about in the podcast is to use our personal email addresses. It's Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Send us those questions, comments. We love sharing them. Um, the first one. Okay, this is a question from Mark. And he uh, says, uh, we'd like to uh, tow our camper to Alaska, uh, which would kick off uh, a box on our bucket list. If we do, would you get a, a better price for it in Alaska than we would in the lower 48? Because we're thinking of selling it. If so, we drive back without it and upgrade down under. Thank you. That's an interesting thought. So Question. his bucket list is an RV trip to, to Alaska. He wants to take his RV up there. Yeah, and then he wants to sell it. And he wants to sell it up there. And well, buy a different one on the lower you know, oh, yeah. you might have something there, Mark. I don't know how much more they're worth. We do from time to time hear uh, from folks in Alaska who lament the fact that the selection of RVs and the number of dealerships and places where you can buy them is much more limited. So you might, I would do some research though. Just look for RVs for sale in Alaska. Check out dealerships. Um, whether it's worth it to, to go up there and enjoy it and then sell it and turn around and come back, it, it, it might be. Sounds like a good plan to me. It might be. Uh, anything that gets you to Alaska is a good plan in my bookmark. So, All right, here's a question that comes from Rob. And Rob says, I've been following you the past few years, and I want to thank you for all you do and share with us. I'm closing in an RV property in Birch Bay, Washington, tomorrow, which I'm thrilled about. It's just a 10-minute walk from the beach because we will own the lot, I'm able to rent it out for 30 days at a time to other RVers when we're not using it. But I'm not sure where to advertise a listing. Do you know of any site or online social media spot where I can post my property for rent? Uh, I was inspired to buy this plot after seeing your podcast and articles about Tennessee and other spots where people can own uh, versus being at the mercy of RV parks. Thanks again. All the best. Rob on the West Coast. Um, Rob, I don't know of any, but that's probably enough people are buying property and making it their own little RV retreat that there probably is a market for somebody to start a kind of a, a central clearinghouse for people to advertise where you can rent space. You are in, it sounds to me though, like some sort of a RV development or resort or community that lets you then rent the property out. So. I would assume they have a, a website and I would first look there because maybe other people are listing their rentals there. Uh, so you could try it that way. Uh, but short of a place just to advertise lots that people can rent, um, you know, there's boondockers welcome and overnight RV parking, but, but those tentatively, those are very inexpensive rentals or free. So, uh, or they come with a different membership, like um, Boondockers Welcome is now tied with Harvest Host. So, pure where you can rent an overnight RV spot. I don't know of a site that really has 
uh, there's a couple of small ones. I'm not even going to talk about them, but anything that has any scale to it that would get a lot of traffic, I don't know of any, but maybe that's something we have, we could do if we ever get some spare time on our hands, start mm -hmm. one of those. Let us know if you find one. We'll be happy to take a look at it and share it with our audience if it looks good. So, uh, And good luck and enjoy your property. Uh, our property in Tennessee, we're going to hopefully see that in a couple of weeks. We're getting really close to having everything done. So we'll share that to you in a video when we, uh, when we get down there, uh, hopefully within the next few weeks. All right, one more question. One more question, and this one is from Charlene. Looking at used diesel pushers and just watched your video on the RV boom ending. I've heard people say that the 2008 to 2012 and the 2020 are not quality. Uh, do you have a response as to what age we should be looking for? We are looking at the Tiffin Motorhomes, as this is what we have owned in the past. I've also heard Numar is a good brand. Numar is a good brand. Tiffin, of course, has been one of the best brands. They recently were bought uh, and are now owned by Thor Motor Coach. But one of the neat things Thor does when it buys up these companies is they let them stay pretty much uh, separately managed like Tiffin, you know, and Bob Tiffin, old Bob still at the helm there. Those are always good motorhomes. Yeah, um, we got to be careful. We're old Mike and Jen. We are old Mike <laughs> and Jen, yes. Um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk about COVID coaches, you know, COVID RVs that were built in 2020 when the plants were shut down and they had to hire people and they couldn't get them. And then there's a lot, as you mentioned, around 2008, the last recession. But in general, um, the quality's okay. I think it's probably has slipped a little bit uh, in 2020 and 2021 because of a couple of things. Uh, the difficulty of getting trained help, everybody had to lay everybody off and then they had to hire workers, they hired uh, and then the boom happened and then they had to hire a lot of new workers and so certainly you can understand some things are going to slip through um, and then the industry got hit by the parts shortage so they had to sometimes substitute parts uh, but I think those are largely settled and I think that a good inspection will tell you if you've got any serious issues that's why we always recommend um, having an RV uh, inspection done carefully done on anything you're going to purchase. Make sure that it's all good. Um, but go ahead and get one. <laughs> and uh, uh, you're looking for motorhomes with Tiffin and, uh, uh, and, uh, Newmar. and Newmar. And I think you'll, you'll be happy with, uh, with either brands. And if you're familiar with Tiffin, you probably got a dealer that you already like to work through. So that, I would, that would tilt my decision a little bit. All right. Well, we had a fun time with this podcast. We hope you liked it too. Again, send us your comments, your questions, your feedback, anything you think we should share with the larger RV community. Just send it to us at our private email, Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll be back next week. Happy trails. <laughs>